Hello everybody. So let me introduce myself. I am Arabin Roy. I am a cornea consultant at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Vijayawada in India. And today we are going to talk about scleral and corneal inflammatory disorders. Now, this talk will be about the inflammatory condition that we commonly encounter in anterior segment practice, namely scleritis, episcleritis, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, and Moran ulcers. So before we start the talk, could you please indicate your position? Thank you very much. So we have a lot of ophthalmologists in practice, and I'm sure in your practice, you would be seeing a lot of these conditions which you need to manage in your day-to-day -day practice. So would you, how would you rate, how would you rate your access to rheumatology support services for your practice? Do you have these services or they are somewhat limited or you do your immunosuppressants yourself? You administer them under your care in your institution or in your practice area. Okay, that's good to know that there is a fair access to rheumatology and this is very important in the management of these conditions as we will be discussing during the course of our lecture. So why this disease is important is that it is a serious and vision threatening inflammatory disease of the eye. The reported incidence is 3.4 per 100,000 person years. There is often an associated systemic disease in 40 to 57% of cases. And whenever there is a serious systemic disease that is associated with this condition, the mortality rate shoots up. So some studies have reported the mortality rate from 27% to as high as 45% in three years duration from detection. So the milder form of the disease is episcleritis, which can be a diffuse or a nodular form. The association with systemic disease does exist and often there is a transient mild pain or ocular discomfort. One may see a nodular or a diffuse elevated mass that blanches typically with phenylephrine. The very transient and mild nature of this condition is often the hallmark of this condition. So there may be several autoimmune diseases that can be associated with this. It could also be associated with bisphosphonate drug reactions or there may be miscellaneous causes such as atopy, etc. that may be associated with this condition. The treatment again is also self-limiting because this is in itself, in the natural course of the disease, a very transient self-limiting condition. And often the first line of treatment is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and lubricants. In persistent, recurrent or bilateral cases, which are non-responsive to conventional treatment, one can provide a short course of topical corticosteroids. So what is the least commonly associated symptoms with episcleritis? Okay, so all of this can be associated with episcleritis. However, typically peripheral ulcerative keratitis does not occur or is very rarely associated with episcleritis. Though can present with decreased vision, mainly because of the ocular irritation and the symptomatic nature of this condition. There may be a transient uveitis. There may are systemic associations as we discussed shortly before. However, the entity of peripheral ulcerative keratitis is more commonly associated with the more severe form of the disease, which is scleritis. So this was a patient who was a 45 year old patient with recurrent attacks of redness over the past four to five years. The Monto was strongly positive and the ESR was raised. The RA factor and the other labs were negative in her case. At presentation, she presented with a triangular patch of reddishness in the right eye. And very typically, as you see, the moment 10% phenylephrine drops were instilled in her eye. There was an immediate blanching of that condition. So it transient recurrent nature of this condition, the typical blanching. And when we put a slit lamp beam over this area, we can very clearly see that there is a very superficial swelling, which is very congested, consisting of dilated large caliber vessels, which immediately decreases in its color. 
and it almost blanches out to appear normal. So unless you have actually not seen the patient prior to dilatation, one may also miss this very subtle findings in the clinical picture in the, as the presenting symptom of these patients. So this patient was again managed with uh, lubricants and oral anesthetics as the first line therapy. And then she was uh, referred to the physician for a COPS focus. That came out to be negative and the patient was managing well with the lubricants alone subsequently. The more ominous of this, these entities is scleritis. Scleritis again can be divided or classified based on the anatomical sites into anterior or posterior. Anterior scleritis again can be of three different types, diffuse, nodular or necrotizing. The necrotizing form with inflammation or without inflammation are the two subtypes of the necrotizing anterior scleritis. Those which is without inflammation is also called as pleuromedacea perforans. So how does one detect scleritis? Now we have discussed about how episcleritis is present, how subtle signs are there, how it blanches with phenylephrine. Now if you have to look at a scleral nodule and then you are often confused that whether it is episcleritis or scleritis, what is the best way to look at? So the best way to look at a scleral nodule is by natural light. The scleral nodule typically is a violaceous, reddish, bluish red, raised, elevated nodule. And often this hue is best detected under natural light conditions. So take the patient close to a window and then just examine under diffuse natural light the hue of the nodule. And often this is a very typical clinical feature which one cannot often miss. And I'm going to show these pictures. So this is how the cases of spheritis would present like. There is typically, there is a deep boring nocturnal pain. The pain which wakes up the patient at night is something very classic of spheritis. There is a violaceous hue or rather a reddish blue hue. The elevation of the deep epispheral tissues and the the classic bending of the light, of a slit beam of light that is focused on the nodules are very typical of scleritis. Often when you examine in red free light or in green light, you can also see a capillary dropout. And often there is a congestion in the deep epispheral vessels. Often there, is, there will be cases of recurrences when there will be recurrent attacks of scleritis which may be at different areas of the anterior sclera. And once this episode passes away, with, the, with time, there will be an underlying thinning of the sclera, causing a UVL show, as you can see in the bottom left picture over here. So these are some of the very telltale signs of scleritis, and it may be associated with several systemic disorders, which makes it much more ominous. Scleritis can also be associated with peripheral ulcerative sclera. Keratitis. So this is a very common association that you see here. Now, when there is an associated peripheral ulcerative keratitis, there are increased chances of association with systemic disease. A study found that if there is scleritis alone, the chance of an association with rheumatoid arthritis or granulomatosis with polyangitis ranges from 11 to 3 percent. However, if scleritis is associated with peripheral ulcerative keratitis, the chances of association with systemic disease increases dramatically from 38.3 to 29.2% respectively in rheumatoid arthritis and granulomatosis with polyangitis, which was formerly known as Wegener's, or Wegener's disease. So coming to one of our cases that we examined, this was a 34-year-old female who was diagnosed with bilateral scleritis, all the labs were negative. We sent her for a rheumatologist consult and she was on oral azathioprine and oral prednisolone in tapering doses. These are a diffuse areas of scleritis where there was a congestion in the deep epispheral vessels. The learning points from this case was that the initial investigations, if you have to do investigation for scleritis, could be focused on RA factor, 
and the anka as compared to the other factors. Montos may be needed and this can be taken up during later visits or before starting immunosuppressants. And in areas where there is a lot of endemicity for tuberculosis, Montu's positivity needs to be interpreted with caution. Another case was of a 41-year-old female who presented with right eye watering, pain and redness for three months. The left eye was essentially normal. The right eye had a diffuse condition. There was the diagnosis of diffuse spheritis and she was both anchor and RA positive. She was advised a rheumatologist consult and was started on oral azathioprine 50 mg. A pulse dose of uh, intravenous methylprednisolone was also given. The rheumatologist planned her for four cycles of IV cyclophosphamide. However, when we performed the hemogram, the hemoglobin was found to be very low. Now, this is something which is very typical that when we manage these cases, there might be a lot of mismatch between the treatment plan and what really happens. So number one is that there might be systemic abnormalities of the patient itself, which does not allow the treatment plan to be carried forward. Number two, these patients more often than not present with only eye present, eye complication or an ocular manifestation. And it is very difficult to explain to these patients, why do we need to do so many systemic investigations? Why do we need to send them to the internist? Why do we need to give infusions? So on and so forth. So these are some of the real life challenges that we face when we treat this very difficult set of clinical conditions that very often come into our clinics. So this patient again proceeded with episodic attacks of redness, diffuse congestion, severe pain, and in the meantime, she had also intermittently stopped her medications. The cyclophosphamide could not be given because the hemoglobin were too low. And until that time, she was maintained on conservative management as well as topical medications. So uh, by topical medications, we gave her only lubricants and we gave her oral azathioprine alone. So with two or three recurrences until her hemoglobin this, this is a case which is still under our treatment. The uh, disease relapsed with this and then after that it went into remission. Following which as you can see as the congestion faded away, there is some amount of pleural thinning and UVL show. So the lab investigations in this were the complete hemogram, the hemoglobin, the liver function tests and subsequently she was shifted to oral methotrexate. With this, she was in remission and she is maintaining in remission so far. And we are also trying to go for the improvement of her hemoglobin levels. And also in case there is a recurrence, we now have an option to go in for the plan as advised by the rheumatologist. So when we talk about steroiditis, we need to understand that we need to observe these lesions, understand the presentation at and also see how these lesions look like, look for capillary dropouts, look for the violaceous hue, important to elevate the eyelid, examine for the sclera for nodules, and also look for areas which may have areas of scleral thinning and UVL show. It's important to also examine them in red free light to look for areas of subtle capillary dropouts. The baseline investigations include the complete blood count, liver function test, renal function test, Montos, the blood sugar levels, etc. before starting immunosuppressants. Montos positivity as discussed also needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because those areas where there is a high endemicity, the positivity alone does not point towards the POC focus. Whereas if there is a reactivation of the disease during the course of the treatment, a POC positivity can be very ominous also. So all this needs to be taken into consideration when we are treating spheroiditis and also treating with immunosuppressants. So what are the lab investigations that we should do and where we should do them? We should do this when there is a persistent or recurrent epispheroiditis. All spheroiditis or in bilateral spheroiditis, unilateral necrotizing spheroiditis in cases where we suspect infection. So, Okay. 
so when we talk about uh, lab investigations it's also important to understand that all spheroiditis may have associated uh, systemic disorders so all spheroiditis probably need to be investigated diffuse anterior spheroiditis and unilateral spheroiditis are very common in day to day practice necrotizing spheroiditis may have seropositivity for anca ama and ra the interpretation again depends upon the raised esr c reactive protein the serum anca levels and other tests such as the anti ccp hla is positive mantus in case of viral infection etc these also need to be taken into account during the management of spheroiditis it's important to look into baseline investigations these include the viral markers mantu complete blood count and blood sugar levels for etiological purposes it's important to uh, have a baseline bouquet of tests if you have to do a test go ahead and do for the anca and the ra factors then followed by ana anti rod ds dna etc for uh, local investigations of the eye go for a uh, anterior fluorescence angiography ubm b scan scrapings impression cytology and biopsy wherever required so when managing spheroiditis often there is a step ladder pattern in which one needs to approach these cases the first line of treatment always is oral nsaids oral nsaids could be something like oral endomethacin or naproxen or ibuprofen and if there is a therapeutic failure then one can switch to systemic steroids systemic steroids however after there is a remission one needs to maintain on nsaids because there are several systemic issues as well as other uh, compliance and therapeutic failure with prolonged use of systemic steroids so the third line of treatment is immunosuppressives which include methotrexate cyclophosphamides cyclosporin or in very resistant cases go for biologics which include infliximab etanercept and rituximab so in a retrospective study the group from poster presented their findings of the treatment with different types of spheroiditis with nsaids systemic uh, anti inflammatory drugs which are the steroid anti inflammatory drugs and the immunosuppressants so this is this table classifies the patients who were subjected to initial treatment in different class of drugs so the different class of drugs as you can see nsaids are more focused on the diffuse nodular forms of the disease and in the necrotizing forms the immunosuppressants are what have been advised and the study found very interesting results that as expected that the necrotizing uh, disorders have almost 100% treatment failure with nsaids with fairly better performance with steroids and immunosuppressants as you can see in the bottom right part of the table so patients in total 27% of patients had it had a treatment failure out of which 26% of them failed with immunosuppressants and 37% failed with steroids and 17% amongst those who were given nsaids so when they analyzed their the response to drugs the treatment failure was more in the more severe form of the disease where immunosuppressants were initially advised and there are five treatment failures as compared to where steroids were the initial treatment and then they had shifted to uh, from steroids to systemic immunosuppressants this was a very interesting uh, a review of literature on the causes and treatment of spheroiditis so the data is that of systemic immunosuppressive therapy for eye disease cohort study and it assembled various non comparative data that was derived from several retrospective series so there are several studies that were conducted as part of the site trials and uh, all the different immunosuppressants were compared with regards to their efficacy meaning that what is the success when using these immunosuppressants 
in order to provide a systemic disease free remission at 6 months and at 12 months to patients who are recruited in this study. So when they compared methotrexate to agathiophyll, mycophenolate mofetil, cyclosporine and cyclophosphamide, the treatment success within six, 6 months was very good for those patients who had been on methotrexate and cyclosporine as compared to the other drugs. The efficacy was found to be moderately successful and the similar patterns were seen both at 6 months and at 12 months. So if you can see the 12 month data of treatment success, 25% of these patients were on no systemic steroids when continued on cyclosporine and 17.5% of patients were on no systemic steroids at 12 months when they were on methotrexate. The common complication of systemic immunosuppressants include GI offset, hepatotoxicity and systemic immunosuppression which makes them susceptible to infections. So this was a case of a 53 year old female who had recurrent attacks of redness in her left eye for 4 years. Her anti-nuclear antibody was found to be positive and the anti-Smith antibody was also positive. She was a case of systemic lupus erythematosus, which is a very chronic condition which can present with non-specific symptoms such as fever and migratory joint pains. So these patients uh, have a raised ESR, often RA factor can be concomitantly positive. So this was the clinical picture at presentation that are re repeated recurrences and then she was managed with systemic immunosuppression, which led to remission subsequently. She was on both oral steroids pulse doses of IV cyclophosphamide, oral hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine. Her uh, systemic tests were within normal limits. She had episodes of uh, remission and relapse when there was a raised ESR. Often due to either, either due to the disease or due to the, the drugs that are administered, these patients can have a concomitant cataract. So this was a 65 year old lady who had a two month history of redness, labs negative and this was the presentation and at presentation she had a pterygium and there was also UVL show the disease was not very active as you can see in the bottom pictures. So she was managed with oral methotrexate and systemic corticosteroid and these patients often have concomitant cataract. So how do we manage them? So we normally look for episodes of remission, patients are usually well managed prior to the cataract surgery with either a pulse dose of IVMT or oral corticosteroid with immunosuppressants and once the disease is poisoned we go for a limbal phaco or a clear corneal phaco and often post scleritis cataract surgery has been found in our hands to be pretty safe with no recurrence or exacerbation of the disease condition and more often than not these patients also do well visually and we give them an option to be visually rehabilitated. This patient had a very good visual uh, response and she was 2030 best corrected after surgery. So these are her pictures, clinical pictures at the day one and at one month post-operatively. The disease as you can see is pretty quiet. She is on oral steroids at a very low maintenance dose with methotrexate. It's often important in these conditions to make the distinction between infectious versus non-infectious varieties. So when we are dealing with an infectious etiology, as you can see a very suspicious nodule in the bottom picture, these patients are usually more symptomatic. Often there might be a cost pointing. Sometimes there is a concomitant involvement of the adjacent cornea, some cellularity, some infiltrate, there might be anterior chamber reaction or hypopia. Often it is important to investigate these patients thoroughly, do a proper microbiology workup. Often it would require taking the patient to the operating room, exploring the pus filled pockets, deroofing them and sometimes it is also not unusual to find at the additional pockets which are not visible on the clinical on the, on the slit lamp and on table when we expose the conjunctiva, there are different pockets of pus which are connected to each other. 
So in these cases, it's very important to completely deroof them, take the sample for microbiology, and then treat as per etiology. The other ominous finding is that of spiritis, which does not respond to all the conventional therapy. Are we looking at the malignancy? Oh yes, that's possible. Sometimes the, the conditions such as metastasis, lymphoma, or uveal coloboma can also present as an unusual form of spiritis, and one should keep masquerades as one of their differentials. With this, we come to another very interesting entity which is called as the peripheral ulcerative keratitis. And that's again something which is extremely common in anterior segment practice. So PUK or peripheral ulcerative keratitis can present with a crescent shaped stromal inflammation. It's often involving the limbal cornea. There is an overlying epithelial defect. There is progressive loss of the corneal stroma. Often there might be corneal perforation. And the adjacent conjunctiva, episthera or sclera, may also be involved. So, what type of spheritis, or which is most commonly seen? PUK with spheritis is most commonly seen in which condition? So, PUK can be associated with any of the choices that are displayed on the screen right now. However, it can be most commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis. There is a known association with GPA, SLE and PAN, but by far rheumatoid arthritis is the commonest. So we have a 50 year old female patient who presented with the right eye watering, pain and redness for two months. She was diagnosed as a right eye peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Uh, she had anchor positivity and was advised rheumatology opinion. So when she presented, there was a peripheral corneal furrow and there was a suspicious area of the sclera that was associated with the peripheral ulcerative keratitis. She was not very willing to go to the rheumatologist. So she was started with in our care with oral steroids and oral thiopin tablets. There was a continued deterioration. The spiral melt continued to progress relentlessly and a spiral patch graft was flat. So with repeated episodes of spiral thinning, there was a suspicious area of UVL show with a dirty looking conjunctiva covering it. And when we explored this patient on table, we found that there was a large area of the sclera which had melted out in addition to the peripheral ulcerative keratitis. So that alone could not be managed with a simple tissue adhesive and after exposing the entire sloughed out necrotic sclera, the area of the spiral defect was measured and a spiral patch graft was placed over this. So while this is a very simple surgery which several of you can actually incorporate or if you are already doing that's, that's even better is to put a spiral patch graft to provide tectonic support. However, it is important to understand that there is a spiral component and there is this is the spiral patch graft as it was integrating into the underlying sclera post treatment. However, it is important to understand that there are serious systemic anomalies that are associated with these conditions. Not only there is a risk of mortality, but there is also a concomitant underlying autoimmune pathology. And unless these pathologies are not addressed, the disease is going to be relentless. And that's exactly what happened in this case, that in the lack of a definitive systemic treatment, the underlying disease continued to progress so, so much that the spiral patchcraft almost melted away. And she finally came into the remission after the initiation of IV cyclophosphamide in pulse cycle doses, which finally led to remission. So if we chart her clinical course, she came as a case of peripheral ulcerative keratitis with a concomitant clearitis. There was a relentless progression requiring a spiral patch graph and finally a remission after control of the systemic condition. 
It's a very similar case was a 36 year old female who presented with a right eye redness of five days duration. The left eye was lost two years ago. We had no prior history about how this patient uh, lost her other eye, except that there was an anterior cephaloma. On examination, she had undergone right eye tissue adhesive and bandage contact lens done for the right eye three months earlier in the right eye. The left eye was no PL. The labs were weakly anchor positive. We started her with uh, oral corticosteroids and other things. So this was the clinical picture of the left eye and the right eye. And she was advised a uh, conjunctival resection and tissue adhesives with bandage contact lens for the right eye with the oral uh, steroids and other therapy with which the condition resolved over a period of uh, three to four months. And the bottom right picture shows her current clinical picture, which is of a vascularized scar cornea. And she is one eye. The vision is hand motions. So we have planned her for a Prill AMG, penetrating keratoplasty, and a tarsorapy. So these cases, and all the time she will be under the systemic immunosuppression. So these case patients are extremely difficult to manage, and often they may require very difficult, complicated surgery. The graft survival is challenging. There is always a risk of recurrence of the underlying disease process and exacerbation of the ocular inflammation, all of which may compromise the disease. Uh, process and the graft clarity. We must distinguish peripheral ulcerative keratitis from Murens. We shall be discussing Murens subsequently in a, in a much more detail immediately after this. What is the distinguishing factor of Murens from PUK is that the pain is disproportionate to the lesion. There is often an overhanging edge, vascularization right up to the bed of the cornea. There is no associated spheritis or no associated systemic disease. And we can contrast this to terians where there is a superior or sometimes a 360 degree fine yellow white stromal opacities with a peripheral guttering. The guttering can often be separated from the limbus by a clear zone and there is a band of lipid at the central edge. So this is a very typical feature of terians which helps us distinguish between POT. The causes or the associations of peripheral ulcerative keratitis can be quite wide and varied. The commonest of which would be rheumatoid arthritis and vaginars. The local causes would be Murens or marginal keratitis. And there can be several infectious causes for peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Murens ulcer is a painful progressive chronic ulcerative keratitis. It begins peripherally and relentlessly continues to progress throughout the circumference of the cornea. There is a leading edge which is active with some cellularity. It's an overhanging corneal edge and the trailing edge is often thinned out, vascularized and it continues until it involves 360 degrees of the cornea. The classic feature is that there is no concomitant involvement of the sclera. The DM is also unaffected. And often, after the entire cornea has been wiped out, the disease reaches poisons. There is a classification based on the presentation. It could be unilateral murens, which is a painful, progressive corneal ulceration, usually seen in elderly patients. There is a non-perfusion of the superficial vascular plexus. It could be a bilateral aggressive Murens ulcer, which is seen in young patients. It progresses circumferentially and then central. An anterior FA shows vascular leakage and new vessel formation on the base of the ulcer. And it could be a third type, which is a bilateral indolent Murens, which is seen in middle-aged patients presenting with progressive peripheral corneal guttering and a minimal inflammatory response. Often, there is no change from the normal vascular architecture. So these are the typical features in which Murens can present. And it's important to make the, distinguish, the distinction between them and also to understand what is the underlying vascular pathology by which it can present. More often, these patients present with severe pain. The disease is relentless. 
often they are resistant to treatment and they continue to progress until the antigenic challenge by the by the corneal antigens are lost and the eyes the cornea is replaced by thin vascularized scar tissue there are several lab tests that one needs to do in modens and it's important to rule out all the known common systemic association so it's very important to do the complete blood counts do the esr ra factors anti nuclear antibodies anca x ray etc it's very important that some etiology such as a, a viral or a parasitic etiology has been associated in anecdotal reports of modens so it's important to do that and rule them out either the baseline tests are very important to understand that there is no other systemic anomaly that is associated with this condition and very often with the start of the systemic steroids or the immunosuppressants it's also useful to do a conjunctival dissection blue with bcl and this is helpful in two ways so first we will discuss the procedure in which it is done so whenever there is a active area of morels it's important to do a conjunctival dissection which is done 2 mm from each active end and 4 mm from the limbus this is done so that it provides a tectonic support to the thinned out cornea and following this it also provides a biological barrier by receding the conjunctiva from the limbus after that cyanoacrylate glue is applied in a thin film and some amount of it can also be applied to other areas which are thinned out on the cornea after which a bandage contact lens is placed on the cornea so this provides a biological barrier and a tectonic support improves the tectonic stability and in addition you can also give oral and systemic immunosuppressants in managing these conditions so early morens there is a role of conjunctival resection however cases where there is a extreme thinning out of the peripheral cornea in addition to systemic immunosuppressants one needs to do a patch graft or it need some other surgeries which include lamellar keratoplasty keratectomy keratoepithelioplasty tectonic grafts penetrating grafts etc cataract surgery is again something which is very important because these patients after a prolonged treatment may develop cataracts and cataract surgery can be done and there have been publications both from our group and elsewhere which have found cataract surgery to restore vision and provide visual rehabilitation in patients who have previous morens with a burnt out morens and a vascularized cornea the importance of conjunctival resection as a primary surgery is is essential however one needs to understand that in spite of all the best immunosuppressant and the surgical management that are options for treatment of morens ulcer the failure rate ranges from 20 to 64% there was a study from our group which also published that the disease free recurrence was 42% in the first year of treatment and that reduced to 21% when the patients are managed only with immunosuppressants and conjunctival resection over a period of 2 years so what could be the cause of decreased vision in morens so cataracts do occur but when there is no cataract several factors converge to create a scenario where there is a decreased vision what do you think is the best so as uh, most of us are, of you have correctly answered it could be both an iritis an irregular astigmatism and the residual corneal scar all of which can contribute to decreased vision in morens so a step ladder pat pattern or a step ladder approach for the management of morens was devised and this was with our retrospective experience of a decade and was published from our group earlier and this included topical steroids to be given in unilateral cases where there was less than 2 quadrants of peripheral corneal involvement or less than 50% of stromal loss and as the disease severity increased 
the degree of immunosuppression also increased. So IVMP with IV cyclophosphamide was uh, required in patients who were one-eyed or those who had bilateral morens with more than three quadrants of peripheral corneal involvement, perforation, and in the early post-operative period, post-keratoplasty or patch graft. So these were the patients who would be most difficult uh, to manage because they had a very aggressive form of the disease and therefore a, a more combined approach of methylprednisolone with IV cyclophosphamide was planned in these cases. The uh, results were as shown on your screen. The pa there were 145 patients who had uh, been treated with topical steroids alone and there, had, there were 41 recurrences in this series with the time of to success ranging from 34 to 52 days with a duration of follow-up of 51 to 81 days and a range of 1 to 521 days. So those patients who required a little more stronger version of these uh, therapy which included oral steroids, oral methotrexate, IVMP, IVMP with cyclophosphamide are as shown. The overall success was very good in all of the categories which were better than 70% in all the categories which were given oral steroids, oral methotrexate, cyclophosphamide and IVMP. The complications include co-infection and there were recurrences. The recurrences were more with topical steroids alone because quite obviously this is an immune mediated disease and we will need a systemic immunosuppressant to manage or control this clinical condition. There was a very interesting paper that was recently published which talks about the role of rituximab in refractory movements. They, this was a series of five patients who were refractory to all forms of systemic immunosuppressants. The authors subjected these patients to two cycles of uh, rituximab, which were given in the dose of 1000 milligram at two weeks interval, and they found remission in all of their cases. So they concluded that in refractory murans, rituximab is a new therapeutic option and can be tried in patients where there is no other option and all the systemic immunosuppressants are fit. So to conclude our discussion, surface inflammations are chronic ocular inflammatory disorders. They are site threatening. They can have systemic associations. Therefore, they are also life threatening. More often than not, the ophthalmologist is uniquely placed in order to be the point of first contact. And it's very important to have a team approach where we discuss this case with the internist and the rheumatologist and have a multidisciplinary approach to manage these cases. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my mentor and colleague and our team of fellows and optometrists who have helped us manage this difficult uh, and challenging series of cases. Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions before we end the session for today. So sclerokeratitis is sometimes it is an infectious etiology. It could be associated with HSV and that is both a component of a, of a corneal and a scleral pathology and that needs and one needs to rule out an infectious etiology before going ahead and treating it. How can one identify the active end of Muran's ulcer? Muran's ulcer has a leading edge which has a cellularity overhanging edge and there is a vascularization. The trailing edge is often scarred, thinned out and vascularized. So the difference is that the active ulcer would have an epithelial defect with the overhanging edge and a cellularity. How do we decide between oral anesthetes or steroids to start treatment in a patient with scleritis? So, and as we discussed the stepladder approach to the treatment of scleritis, oral anesthetes are the first line of management. And when there is a treatment failure with oral anesthetes, it is recommended to switch over to steroids. And when the disease is in remission, maintain that with oral anesthetes. 
how do we preserve the sclera i think we can take the sclera in absolute alcohol and keep it uh, for later use nevanac can be used uh, as a topical nsi nsaid you can also use flubiprofen cyclophosphamide can be given in the dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg per, per dose or one can give a iv bolus dose in a pulse the difference between inflamed pterygium and epispheritis is by subjecting the the i to instilling one drop of 10% phenyl ethyl epispheritis more often tends to epispheritis tends to blanch in recurrent peripheral ulcerative keratitis can nsaid be tried first yes you can try definitely thyroid workup uh, not not routinely we do not do that routinely murens and terians so as if you would recollect the picture from the lecture terians would have a thinned out margin with it with a clear zone between the lesion and the limbus often there will be vascularization and raised yellowish plaques which are the lipids that have uh, that have excess that have uh, come out from the blood vessel so that would have extravasated from the blood vessels and then they are deposited in the ring is there any room for topical nsaids in sclerosis uh, sclerosis i believe so i have already answered this that this is the first line management but then again these are with oral nsaids not topical nsaids i believe you can use these tissues for 3 uh, months or as long as your i bank mentions on the accompanying papers with the tissue the difference between muren ulcer and sclera and peripheral ulcerative keratitis is that both of them involve the peripheral cornea however uk can have a concomitant episcleral or scleral involvement whereas murens would have no scleral component no involvement of the dm and there is no systemic association of murens so murens is a disease which you diagnose after ruling out all the systemic causes and murens can present as unilateral bilateral or unilateral indolent so it can be unilateral bilateral aggressive bilateral indolent three forms in which it can present can chemical injury cause sclerosis uh, yes it causes that but that is not the autoimmune sclerosis that we are discussing right now after how many days or weeks of using nsaids is a failure uh, well you have to uh, review the patient on on a daily or weekly basis and if there is a worsening then one will need to switch over to the stronger immunosuppressants which are both oral steroids or oral immunosuppressants okay so uh, surgically induced necrotizing sclerosis is something which is very typical typically seen after an episode of uh, of a surgery more often it is after pterygium surgery though it can present after any form of surgery maybe cataract or trap etc so it needs to be again managed with oral corticosteroids as well as systemic immunosuppressants sometimes one also needs to preserve the surface promote healing by putting a spiral patch graft by doing a amniotic membrane transplant etc Okay thank you very much This is indeed a very very challenging condition and more often as an anterior segment surgeon you will see several cases which will require you to have a multidisciplinary approach and collaborate with the internist and the rheumatologist before managing these conditions So it is like the immunosuppressive drugs are given on the basis of the tolerance of the drug and the spectrum and that's how it's not about which would be more effective usually the second and third line drugs are what are given when we give oral immunosuppressants so when we start with oral steroids and then we also need to shift to 
oral immunosuppressants and when they are refractory shift to biologics which would be the maps so if we quickly go into some of the earlier questions that were there i think the first question doesn't really uh, belong to the scope of the current lecture of pediatric herpetic keratitis uh, but however as a cornea as a, as a cornea a practitioner i would definitely recommend that it is treated in the same way as you would treat with adult keratitis the clinically which way is easy to diagnose and differentiate with keratopathy i guess that's again beyond the scope of the current uh, lecture there is one uh, live uh, question which is about the suture we use the 70 vicral suture for spiral patch grafts this is the one that is used by our retina colleagues for uh, the sclerocorneal or the spiral corneal spiral tear repairs and how long would you use systemic immunosuppressants we would use them uh, i would say until remission and then maintain that effective management of acanthamoeba again it is beyond the scope of the current lecture to decide between oral anesthetics this we have discussed the oral anesthetics are the first line therapy before uh, shifting to a more uh, potent form of the medication in terms of oral uh, steroids the uh, diagnosis of spiral inflammation this is important one needs to look for elevated nodules diffuse involvement violaceous hue use natural light condition often use a red free filter or a green light to look for capillary dropouts and also look for areas of uvl show due to spiral thinning there is no pediatric approach but usually we do not uh, see these cases in pediatric uh, populations not very common Uh, sclerokeratitis again this is a concomitant involvement when there is both a scleral and corneal component more often than not there is this maybe a inflammatory component with infectious background the treatment for recurrent episcleritis again one needs to shift into more potent forms of immunosuppressant and definitely look for systemic associations uh, most one most common spiral and corneal inflammatory disease well it's it's both episcleritis pruritus puk and more and they you have the entire spectrum with you these are something which is very commonly seen in the anterior segment practice but yes the pruritus and episcleritis tend to be somewhat more common in our practice uh, corticosteroid drops in keratitis again i think the uh, question is more pertaining to the role of corticosteroid in infectious keratitis which is a very controversial topic and this is not really pertaining to the scope of the current lecture we have a live question which is about the necessary labs for using immunosuppressants so as we referred to during our talk the uh, labs include the baseline hemogram look for etiology look for amantos positivity and look for any viral markers so look for any any possible predisposing infection the blood sugar levels and also look for any etiological uh, factors so after ruling them out one needs to start the immunosuppressants okay great so i think we have a very productive session and really enjoyed uh, the questions posed by the attendees so i'm sure if there are further questions uh, you will direct them by mail to me and we look forward to one more session with all of you too